So um, we're here from um, Supply View. We're here to talk about how you set up your supply chain for the digital, NA digital age, enabling synchronized, self-managed, and sustainable supply chains. So who are we? We are Supply View. You, we've got a stand down in the foyer. Come and visit us, stand B. Uh, we've got our dragon demonstrator here today. So uh, do pop along and give us the opportunity to show it off to you. Um, but this is our vision. One day, all supply chain networks will be synchronized, self-managed, and sustainable. And I'm sure that's something that you can all get behind. So who are we today um, on stage? There's myself, Christine McNeil, um, and my colleague, Kim. Do you want to stand up and then people I'll can see you, up. Kim? Don't fall up. Hi, everybody. I feel I do know quite a few people in the audience already. Um, but uh, my name's Kim Lloyd. I've been working with Supply View actually only a year and a half. Prior to that, I worked for 25 years in industry, uh, of which 21 years was with John and P&G. Uh, so I get that confession out right from the start. So a lot of what we are talking about today also kind of reiterates um, all the work that certainly I was part of with John five years ago, six years ago at PNG on how to synchronize your supply chains. Uh, I was then the UK and Ireland supply chain director for Philips before I then got convinced to come over to not the dark side, um, but to come and work with supply chain software solutions that really will enable you then to step change and move your supply chain networks into the synchronized world and enable you to make the most of all the digital solutions out there. Okay. Chris? Uh, and I'm Chris McNeil. I've been with Supply View slightly longer than Kim. I've been um, with them about three years. Prior to that, I spent 25 years um, first in industry um, in oil and gas, um, and then I moved into consultancy for a period, worked with Accenture for a while, um, and then I spent the last sort of 12 years with uh, British American Tobacco in a variety of different um, European um, and UK roles. Um, we've got Andy and Jason uh, on the slide as well. They're down in the foyer, so if you do see them, you'll recognize them. Um, although I think Jason may well have aged quite a bit since that photo was taken. Um, anyway, please do pop along to our stand, come and see us. Can I just give you that back? So, where are we? Basically, as you can see from this chart, um, the IT subway map, which I shamelessly picked off the internet, um, over the last 10 years, companies have invested heavily in supply chain technology, and what a lot of supply chain technology there is out there. This um, subway map categorizes the different types <coughs> of supply chain management software into sort of 16 broad areas. But as you can see from the map, a lot of the providers on it are um, intersecting. So all of these different softwares out there are all overlapping. Um, and that makes it very difficult for people like you who are um, supply chain managers or um, IT managers to make sure that you've got the right um, software for your business. So we're going to have a little... Uh, Mentimeter challenge. Hopefully, this is going to work. If my um, colleague down at the back there can switch us over to the Mentimeter. Okay, so did you see the code? Or you can write it. If you go to, on your phone, if you type in uh, www.mentimeter.com and you use this code, you should be able to vote on this. Has everybody used Mentimeter? <coughs> question. It's also a really good learning experience to take back to your companies. But when I got introduced to this, it's brilliant to get interaction with um, your organisations, just to answer questions as you present to them. So have a go at it, because it will uh, enable you to become an expert and take it back. And it's free to use as well, so you can just set oh, it so up. So we've got one it. person voting two. Votes coming in. We've got the vote from... Iceland yet, yeah. <laughs> vote from Finland. Has Wales voted yet, Beth? Yeah, Wales voted. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute movement. <laughs> See how easy it is to use, everybody. I mean, it's great to take back to organisations. So. One tip from us. <laughs> okay? Has anybody voted who wants to vote? 
no last minute people coming in. No. So basically, I mean, what we can see is that you've all got lots of money to spend and you've been um, <laughs> spending it a lot. And I think um, in, the, in the UK, we like to compare spend to things that we could have bought with that money. So I just, uh, you know, if you add up eight times 500k, so that's four million, um, three at a million, that's seven million, eight at five million is four. <laughs> <laughs> 40, so we're, we're up to sort of 47, uh, 57 million, you know, 67 odd million. With that sort of money, you could have built a small hospital with 500 beds. You could have built three large secondary schools in big urban areas. Um, you could have had countless hip operations. Um, so it kind of just gives you an idea of the sort of scale of money that we are spending on um, IT systems in the supply chain area. And if I just go to the next question, which I think if I do this. Yep, so the next question, if you'd like to vote um, again, hopefully the next question will have appeared on your phone. How do you rate your supply chains? So you've spent all this money. Do you think that you've got leading supply chains? Are you proficient or are you still bumbling along on the baseline? I think 27 people. It is anonymous, so you don't panic. 27 people voted on the previous um, slide, so I'm not going to stop until that number's gone up to 27. Ooh. Was that you, John? You're leading. So I think everybody's now voted who voted on the... Oh, we've got more people voting this time. Maybe some of you weren't in control of your budget. Sorry, do I need... If I'm going... Sorry. Um, so really, the, the purpose of this exercise... Is that okay? Can, yeah. The purpose of this exercise was really just to um, sort of bring out the fact that we've spent lots of money on our supply chains. We could have built some hospitals, and we know how quick they build hospitals in China um, these days. We could have built a, a couple of small hospitals. We could have had some schools. Despite all that money that we've spent on our supply chains, only 16% of us think that we've actually got supply chains which are leading. 52% um, of us still think we're bubbling along at the baseline. 32% um, of us are proficient. So the question is, do we really think that we're getting value for money from those systems that we've put in? Um, and if not, why not? I don't know whether any of you have got any thoughts on that that you want to share with us. No? Okay. Oh, so I'll just go on to the next one. So the good news is you're not alone. Um, so basically, despite the step check, despite the um, investment that we've seen in supply chain systems, we haven't really seen a step change in business performance. So on the um, left-hand side, we can see that although uh, revenues of companies have risen, the cost of generating that revenue has also risen. And as a result, we've got absolutely flat uh, gross margins. So this is based on um, American companies. I deliberately chose American companies for two reasons. Number one, because there wouldn't be too many American people in the audience today to sort of pick holes in the numbers, uh, but also because it's much more easy to compare um, American accounting data because of the way that they uh, report their reports in much more standardized way. So I was able to take data from 19 of the sort of largest sort of FMCG uh, product-based companies um, in the US um, and make these comparisons. And the data goes from 15 years um, up until 2018. So basically, despite the fact that companies have been investing heavily in their IT infrastructure, we're not seeing a commensurate improvement in the business performance. 
And that doesn't just relate to overall business performance, as these slide, this slide shows inventory, which is obviously a key measure for the supply chain, is remaining um, absolutely flat. So the orange line on this right-hand bar is the um, average days of, of inventory for all of those same companies over that 15-year period. And you can see that even though the maximum has changed quite a bit over the time, the minimum level hasn't changed at all, and the um, average level has remained absolutely flat. So yet again, we've, we're seeing illustrated the fact that companies have spent a lot of money, but they're not necessarily realizing the step change in improvements that they would expect from that level of investment. <coughs> So what has happened? If we aren't seeing an improvement, what has happened? Basically, what we are seeing is that um, instead of supply chains getting better, they're just generally becoming longer, more complex, and more difficult to uh, manage. So we see a lot of um, manufacturing moving east, whether that's into Eastern Europe or whether it's into the Far East. Uh, we see companies uh, growing by acquisition, um, adding other systems, other organizations, becoming ever more um, complex uh, in terms of how to manage. So I'm going to have to just refer to my notes. Um, one of the things that we notice, I'm going to move that now because I'm near the podium again, is obviously when companies grow by acquisition and they um, consolidate, often we end up with two or three different ERP systems which are struggling to speak to each other. So we, we lose the visibility uh, because we haven't got the standardized master data across our organization. Um, and what does that mean for companies? Because customer service remains ever so prevalent in their minds, the way that they then still try and achieve those levels of customer services by buffering, buffering, and buffering. So they've got excess inventory in their factories. They've got extra inventory in their DCs. They're allowing for extra long lead times just in case things go wrong. Um, and it's really those buffers which are causing problems um, for the supply chain. And as we know, if your supply chain lets you down, Absolutely, it's going to be all over the press the following uh, day. So these are just a few um, examples of some bad things that happened when people's <laughs> supply chains went wrong. So, you know, KFC obviously focusing on cost, moving to a new outsource provider. Um, it all went horribly wrong for them. I think that was early last year when they ran out of chicken. Um, shortage of epilepsy drugs in the UK due to manufacturing issues in Europe. Um, Coke was hit, um, as were all of the bottlers. I'm sure we've got some other bottlers in the um, audience today. Pretty much all of the beverage manufacturers were hit when there was the um, CO2 shortage, uh, because basically all the uh, manufacturing sites closed at the same time. So there was no coordinate or closed for shutdowns at the same time. So there was no coordination of these suppliers of CO2 saying, actually, you know what, we need to close our factory down we're going to do it in June. Oh, but you're closing yours down in June. So there was not, none of that sort of visibility across the organization. Um, and then the final example is um, Adidas, who were suffering uh, from issues because they had um, a long supply chain to the Far East. So basically, um, this is just uh, four salutary tales of what can go wrong if you don't get it right in your supply chain. So, you know, what we've seen is big investments in the supply chain, very little step change in improvements, um, and some sort of watch out clauses. And then what I'm going to hand over to Kim to talk about is really about how we can make sure that we don't make the same sort of mistakes with the next <coughs> wave of technologies that are going to come along. So if I just move on to the next slide is that okay Kim and you can trip up on the stage yeah you just press this okay so as Chris said with all that doom and gloom we've got to find a way forward because clearly there's uh, a lot out there a lot of noise around we've got to do something and we've got to avoid the disasters happening and there are people are now itching to get on that digital journey as Chris showed you there's a huge map of opportunities around spending money but how can you be sure that you're focusing on the right thing? There's lots of uh, technology out there. 
new companies are looking at, or companies are looking at ways to invest either in uh, AI, robotics, etc. And certainly one of the things that I've been exposed to over the last year and a half as I've gone around talking to numerous clients is actually because there's been this huge amount of investment into pockets of technology, but it hasn't delivered the benefit, there's actually a bit of resistance out there. People are saying, hang on a minute, we've already spent 100,000, 100 million on technology. I'm not going to spend any more until you deliver benefit. So we're kind of in this catch-22 situation around, okay, how do we move forward in this environment of, I've invested huge amounts of money, but I haven't got the reward, and there's a whole load of technology out there, but I'm not sure about which course of action to take. Okay? So what we're going to introduce you to now is, I'm trying to avoid it not being a sales pitch, but really just introduce you to some approaches and very much centered around a lot of what John taught this morning about a key step that a lot of companies miss is this synchronization piece, which actually will enable you to really then <coughs> deliver what your technology should be able to help you deliver now to give you some freedom to then focus on the next level of the journey and what's the next continuous improvement you need to do. So, um, Everybody can uh, obviously relate to all the new technologies coming up, buzzwords like blockchain, AI, etc. And I think we've all been to presentations where we've frankly been blown away with what the world could look like. And we were at Gartner this year where they talked all these technologies, but actually 95% of the companies out there just weren't using it. Um, and they're not sure how to use it. So let's get back to basics on what do we need to do rather than jump on what is the latest bandwagon. Okay, so try and multitask. And the other interesting thing, clearly, this is a, a bit of an eye chart, but also there's a key reason why you guys are here today. This is actually a summary of all the different reasons, apparently, why you guys wanted to come to this conference. Uh, and it all related to around information and how we use it, etc. Um, but the interesting thing, if you go then to try and bulk those inputs from all of you guys sitting in the audience, about what you said you wanted to look at, um, it actually, a high proportion of the numbers came back to basic supply chain planning and just visibility across your network. Um, so actually, that just reinforced that we just need to go back to the basics and how can we just run our supply chains in the most efficient and effective way. But what does that actually mean? What does going back to basics actually mean? And how do we enable you on that journey um, to ensure that you are delivering <coughs> what you've got with your investment or some additional small investments to deliver a good supply chain. So what we, we at Supply View absolutely believe, and we partner with Warwick University, and uh, um, they see that there are three fundamental ways that you should be looking at your supply chain. Number one is the kind of longer term piece, and this is all the stuff that we did at P&G of CD ratios, have we got a right balance of capacity to demand? Are we looking at a network that is just fundamentally balanced? Uh, and um, Professor Martin Christopher from Cranfield, he brings this whole concept in. Of actually, we need to start thinking a bit more about network design and what he calls structural, structural flexibility and how can you really enable just a bit more agile, um, agility within that, um, that structural network. So think about some of the stuff that John was talking earlier around how do we make our supply chains more agile, that you can move in and out of um, different factories and warehouses in a more um, uh, agile and um, uh, acceptable way. So it's that kind of longer term piece where you're fundamentally balancing supply and demand um, that is key that will really drive your cost reduction. And John gave a really good example also um, when you do fundamentally synchronize your network, actually, that can drastically reduce the need for that, cult, uh, that capacity uh, spend because you don't need the amount of warehouses or factories that you potentially have invested in here. So, um, and what we've seen, uh, certainly with a lot of clients that we've worked on over the last, what well, I've worked on with the last year and a half, there's a lot of focus on these two elements of getting the right balance of your capacity and demand and they're focusing on executing excellently. And the bit they've missed out in the middle is actually, are they getting good flow within their networks? And actually, if they'd done that piece of work, they would have avoided a lot of this capital spend on warehousing and factories that they needed. 
Um, and obviously, the far right-hand side is all about the now, the executing with excellence, and absolutely investing in your IWS programs, your lean programs within your sites that you're executing with, uh, with stability and um, uh, absolute assurance of what the factories can do. So the bit that's in the middle that we've highlighted, which is the key area that we see that a lot of companies are not focused on, and it's the key part of the, the journey in the kind of the medium term to ensure that you're absolutely optimizing the flow and you're really driving this whole ability to both hit service, reduce inventory, and reduce your cost to serve. Okay, so we're going to focus on synchronization. Um, John did a fantastic job of teeing this up this morning, um, and we were looking at ways of how we could bring it alive. I love your baggage handling example, John, and I loved your examples with your Italian market supply in Morocco. Um, and what we've done is we've tried to introduce a video, it's a two to three minute video, to try and bring across in simple terms what does good synchronization actually mean. Okay? So I'm going to attempt to run this video. Nowadays, every company suffers poor visibility and understanding of the information flow across its supply chain. If information across the supply chain is constantly changing, then trust and the value of the information diminishes. Receiving organisations buffer for this lack of certainty, lead times lengthen and manual intervention increases. It is a world of crisis, firefighting and unnecessary cost and waste. Poor supply chain process synchronisation is the root cause. The solution is to gain full visibility of your supply chain network and synchronise the process throughout the network to coordinate information exchange and product flow. Synchronisation will deliver the quick wins of reducing inventory, manual intervention and lowering costs. It will also set the supply chain on course to take full advantage of the significant efficiency gains that digitalization and process automation are promising. Supply View enables supply chain synchronisation. First, connect and integrate. You can't manage what you can't see. At SupplyView, we enable information integration to increase both visibility and clarity of demand profiles across the supply chain. This improves understanding of the level and causes of information and product flow variability. Second, set demand propagation rules and policies. This means that supply chain processes are coordinated and aligned, and movement and order quantities match operational capabilities perfectly. We apply rhythm wheel-based replenishment methods to create supply plans that maximise flow. These are ideal for underlying supply chain operations and ensure customer service requirements. Third, drive operational efficiency. We use algorithms and rule-based supply chain management policies to stop manual intervention and remove all non-value-added manual work. By creating repetition and predictability, we help you automate and optimise activities for efficiency. Imagine faster, more reliable and lower cost supply chain networks to accelerate the evolution of supply chain management. Supply View, enabling you to achieve a synchronised, self-managing and sustainable supply chain. Sorry about the sales pitch at the end. But, um, so if you are interested in a lot of what John taught this morning and certainly um, uh, uh, the whole synchronisation journey and what are the appropriate steps Obviously, the video will give you some insight, but also come and talk to us and grab a copy of the brochure to help people start that, that journey. Um, so, uh, so, how do you start this journey? Um, because a key thing that we've seen a lot of companies have is they have actually data coming out their ears. And actually, that's part of the frustration. They have invested a lot of money, they have information, but they don't have insight. And that's the key difference is how do you make sure that you're getting your organisation to understand truly what's happening within their supply chain and they've got the right information with the right people who have the right skills to be able to then use it and make a difference in their supply chain. Okay, so some of the key barriers which may resonate to you, uh, and it certainly resonates to me in the world that I certainly experience, and I'll, I'll be very defensive about PNG, not so much in PNG, but certainly in the world that I experienced at Philips where we had multiple different functions that didn't talk to each other. So I would do my work on trying to get create the best plan, the best forecast, etc. I would then in demand planning throw that over to my lovely supply people 
who would then produce something that didn't look anything like my plan. Um, because they were then kind of correcting and manually intervening to what they thought was the real source of truth. So you've got this constant tension within organisations that certainly I've experienced where people have got different metrics that they're rewarded and recognised for. So you've got manufacturing, you've got factories focused on reducing manufacturing costs, which has been a good thing. We've, um, we've now improved a lot of our operational excellence and John touched that on his presentation However, we also know we're working in an environment where uh, the consumer is getting more demanding. Um, so we are increasing our um, portfolio proliferation. However, we have got, typically with the move to the east, we've got longer lead times um, and things are getting more complex, um, more potentially this tension within an environment. Okay? So very much what we're looking for is how do we move away from these barriers, which hopefully I've got a few nods around the audience that people recognise may exist within their organisations. How do we move towards that world of having a whole organisation aligned towards same metrics, same business goals, which is really then underpinned by synchronisation supply chain that does allow you then to get the three things that uh, also John talked of, reduce cost, improve service and reduce inventory. So I'm going to introduce what I, I kind of see as um, the initial causes and the root causes of um, why I think these barriers exist. But it would be great to just get some insight from you guys around what really are some of the causes of those barriers. John talked about some of the things this morning in terms of the metrics. Um, and actually, we see that a lot, in, uh, with, which reinforces the functional silos. So again, you have, for example, your sales team are rewarded to hit their sales targets within certain timelines. So you typically have a demand peak at the end of every quarter or every month. And so you're then distorting what truly is the customer demand. So you've got to then start looking at your data and understanding exactly how you're rewarding and recognizing your organization that actually might be distorting the data rather than truly enabling you to set up a supply chain on what really is needed. Um, so what we see in that functional silo actually keeps reoccurring a down to a base theme of actually it's just having the right information uh, and having the right insights. So again, it's not more information because this information exists, but it's having the true insights about what's driving behavior and then making those metrics really visible within the organization. <coughs> so that's kind of the functional silos. Does that resonate with people? Do, are they working in organisations that are very much driven by I'm responsible for manufacturing cost or I'm responsible for inventory or I'm responsible for, well, frankly, inventory is a difficult one because I can never pinpoint. Nobody puts up their hand and said, I own inventory generally in customers that we talk to. So it's then finding out who owns which bit of inventory or who owns service and how do you bring everybody together to then start talking the same language about what the world could be. And Again, I'm going to keep coming back to you. John gave a really good example of that baggage handling where people are so focused on their own thing that they're measured on, they're just missing the fact that the world could be a lot better if you just moved one step back from the baggage handling container and just looked at how you can improve the overall efficiency of that end-to-end -end supply chain. Okay? So that's kind of the functional silos. The other thing that we really see is this whole thing of disjointed systems. Um, absolutely, it was my world in PNG of multiple different ERP systems, multiple different spreadsheets, multiple different warehousing systems, etc., that just don't talk to each other. So actually, the first thing that you've got to do is just connect that uh, and at least understand holistically what is going on in your end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, so really, uh, uh, um, bring in that um, uh, complete picture. Again, system connectivity, data-driven analytics. The next thing that we've seen is, um, is around this whole thing about um, supply chains have just got more complex. And actually, um, we need to somehow, with, with the data, really challenge, right, have we set up the right structure, the right CD ratios that allows you to have better flow through your network? Um, and it's only, again, with the data that you can prove that actually you're doing the wrong things. Don't invest in your, your three lines out in wherever or your warehousing in Central Europe because actually that might not be the right thing to help the flow. Okay, so 
again, it's all around just having the right information and making the right conversation. But the last one, which John made as the third point, which is a critical one for me, is around the organisational capability and the culture piece. And really, how do you get people on the journey? Do you have top-down, you have a CEO who really buys into the digital journey, or actually you've got to do bottom-up? Which, frankly, you need both. But the way that certainly P&G approached it, and the way that we certainly see that, you do need to run pilots. You need to prove from the bottom up in an organisation what good could look like. So pick an area of the supply chain and just have a go and prove it, that actually the world could be a lot better place if you just created some level of stability and proved across a number of different functional silos, the world could be a lot better, okay? Um, so certainly that organisational capability and that cultural piece is a key part of the journey that you need to bring people on, but the only way to do that is to really use the information and give people insight that helps educate them. Um, so we, I mentioned the three areas, um, so uh, balancing your supply chain, the longer term piece, the mid term piece of synchronising the supply chains and then the immediate short term of just executing well. So what I'm going to quickly talk through is about well, how do you make sure you've got the right data, how do you actually truly get insight and what is good insight and good data. I mean John started to give you some, uh, some slides this morning about looking at things differently, looking at coefficient of variance and all the, that stuff that frankly we never used to look at and, it, uh, and didn't help people understand why we certainly set certain policies within our supply chain. So it's making sure that we're starting to look at data, right data and use it in the correct way. So I'm going to take them one by one. So under balance, which is the longer term piece, you are absolutely looking at things like truly understanding your demand, understanding it right at a skew level, looking at the segments, not just your classic nine box value volume, but this coefficient of variance, the variability, and it's only truly understanding, right down to a product level, what is happening in your demand signal. And it's only when you've got that level of understanding can you then start making the right design choices and how you want to set up your supply chain. Understanding who your customers truly are, where they, uh, where they are, what, they, what do they need, what do they want, and ideally you will synchronize across the customer node and you will synchronize down into your supplier node, but let's not try to boil the ocean, let's focus on our own stuff first. Um, and, uh, but you really do need to understand how they behave, um, uh, have they got particular seasonality that they play with, and you've got to bring in that variability too. And then truly understand your capacities um, and um, the way that you're currently operating um, and design your long term in line with all of those. So am I utilised, are each of my factories utilised, how, how much capacity do I need in the future, where do I need that capacity? So that's kind of the, the, the longer term piece to get the correct CD ratio, the correct balance. Okay? But the thing that's the kind of um, the glue in the middle, as we see it, the real focus on synchronisation and it is absolutely all of this data exists somewhere. Uh, if somebody says to me they haven't got the data, I don't believe it because it's just transactional data that you need to look at. You're just fundamentally understanding um, things like you create a plan, right, how stable is that plan? Am I changing that plan every two minutes, okay? And typically what we find with um, clients, um, so these are lags, okay, we'll look at six weeks out, five weeks, four weeks, three weeks, two weeks, one week, and then actual production, for example. And we'll look at how many times does the plan change every week, and by how much, and how different is it to what actually was then demanded. And what never ceases to amaze me is you'll get right at the top, probably week five, actually a pretty good signal, and there's, then there's so much noise from week two to three as the plan changes every week as somebody has different insight. And then actually, by the time you produce, it's not much different to plan five. So it's that kind of just getting to, into the details of what's causing people to touch the plan. Are they adding any value? If they're not, let the plan run by itself, okay? Um, and then we're looking at, um, is my then plan aligned or have I got correct policies in place? So we're looking at, okay, if we've said now we need to run on a certain cadence, okay, is that cadence actually happening? Am I producing stuff that is all called off every day? Am I producing it every day? 
and then we analyse, well, what are your factories actually producing? And often what you'll see is there is a lot of erratic behaviour that you can't actually see that they're continually producing either a fixed order quantity or a fixed order cycle. So you can then start to look at, well, hang on a minute, you clearly aren't operating 20 policies. You might say you are, but you're not. And it's then really understanding about what's, what are then the right operational conditions to run your operation and are you actually adhering to it. John talked about um, accuracy being in line with demand variability, uh, and then ultimately what you're looking at is, well, right down to a SKU level, am I delivering my service? How much unused inventory have I got in the network? Because if I'm not touching a certain amount of inventory for six months, I know that I've got a huge amount of buffering in my system and I'm not synchronized. And like John, we have a synchronization measure, percentage synchronization measure, within supply view that then will tell you um, how poorly your, uh, your supply chain is and typically it will show out in that level of unused inventory over a significant period of time. So those are kind of some of the key measures but what I'm trying to get you um, introduced to here it's about using data to actually give you insights and truly understand how well your operation is, uh, is uh, how well information is flowing across your operation and how well your products are flowing backwards. And then the last piece, obviously, is then information right down to executional level. And again, what supply view will look at is things like adherence to plan. Are your factories good at, at doing what they say they're going to do on a certain cadence? Um, and you've also obviously got a lot of track and trace capability, which will then um, uh, acknowledge when your plan is going off, off track. So there's a lot of capability to make sure that you've got the right level of insight and that you can action the right uh, in the appropriate way. I'm running out of time, but the key message was um, clearly it's about to drive the change. We absolutely reinforced the message tomorrow, this morning around the first step is actually around truly understanding end-to-end -end visibility, what's going on in your supply chain, and then looking at how can you synchronize better what's going on in your network. Um, how can you then get yourself in a position where you've got um, scope and you're driving huge changes and people are convinced then of what you're investing in technology is actually driving the change and it's a key part of the culture change. They can see that actually the investment they're making is delivering value. Uh, and we saw, um, and we talked earlier around, there's a huge opportunity out there. If you look at um, uh, the average operating costs, um, and I, Chris, help me with some of the numbers. So you've got um, huge amounts. If you look at the average operating cost, and if you look at just taking a small percentage out of there, the savings are immense if you just reduce those operating costs by those small percentages. And I think if you want to come and talk to us, we're at Stan B. Um, are there any questions or comments about your own journey that you've been on? Um, are there any comments around what's really causing you the barriers that, to start this journey? Does it resonate? Has it been yeah. interesting? <laughs> Stunned everybody into silence. Great. Well, come and talk to us on stand B. And uh, we have got various brochures and um, uh, demos that we can show you in terms of giving you insight into some of the the um, information that you can look at in a more effective way. Okay, thank you very much.